Do you ever see a successful woman on your feed or in a magazine and think, wow, it must be nice to have it so easy? Well, think again. Behind that glossy cover or smiling face is a ton of hard work, countless failures, and endless learning experiences. I'm Rebecca Minkoff, and I'm here to tell you that success isn't a walk in the park. It takes grit, resilience, and a willingness to take risks. That's why I created Superwoman, a podcast that peels back the varnish and gets into the nitty gritty of what it takes to make it as a woman in today's world. From luminaries and game changers to women you've never heard of but should, this podcast is here to inspire you to take your next leap, no matter how daunting it may seem. We'll explore the sacrifices these women have made, the highs and lows they've experienced, and the lessons they've learned along the way. So if you're ready to be inspired and learn from some of the most successful women out there, join me on Superwomen. Together, we'll uncover the stories behind the successes and prove that with hard work, determination, and a little bit of luck, anything is possible. Hey everyone, you're listening to Superwomen. Today's guest is Neely Lotan, the founder of her namesake brand. She started her company almost 20 years ago. With a rich history of design serving at companies the likes of Ralph Lauren, Nautica, and Liz Claiborne, Neely still makes her collection in NYC and sells to incredible stores across the U.S. She is an amazing celebrity following with the likes of Jennifer Lawrence, Gwyneth Paltrow, Kaya Gerber. We go deep on what it takes to have a company that lasts, that's timeless and classic, and how she has shaped her aesthetic through the years. Take a listen. Neely, welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to interview you today. Thank you for having me. I have long admired and known your brand and then became a converted (laughs) person. I'm wearing you now, at least the bottoms. But I would love to start at the beginning. You moved here in 1980. Mm -hmm. You went to a prestigious school in Tel Aviv, and there's a lot of stories of people moving here and, and making their way, but you experienced a great trajectory almost right away. So I'd love to hear, you know, what made you want to move to New York City and then pursue a career in design? So I graduated from Shankar College in Tel Aviv and I got married very young. I was 21 years old. Ah. So it was actually on my second year in college. So when I graduated, it was just about the time that my husband at the time graduated from his military service. He was a pilot in the Israeli Air Force, and he was giving eight years of service. And he basically had the option to stay in the army or leave, and he decided to leave. And he was obsessed about going to the United States and studying here. During his service, he was one year stationed in Alabama and trained with the U.S. Air Force and uh, wanted badly to come back. So when I finished, we decided they will come to New York and he will resume his studies here. Little did I know that I have absolutely nothing to do in Alabama. So we were starting to discuss the options and then obviously at one point my father said, you're not talking my daughter to Alabama. If you want, you can take her to New York. And that's how we ended up in New York. I had no desire or wish to end up here. If anything, I would be excited to move to Paris or to Milan, which is where my eyes and my taste would have taken me. But New York at the time wasn't so interesting from a fashion perspective or anything that I would say, oh, wow, I want to go to New York. Uh, And I just was at the beginning of my career, so it really is a career that was really informed where I want to go. And so anyway, I was uh, an obedient wife and I went with my husband to New York. But I said, I said to myself, I'm gonna get the most out of it. The idea was just for him to study three, four years and then we go back to Tel Aviv and continue our life there. But I said, I'm going to do the best of what I can in this three, four years. So I started to look for a job and I realized it was very, very difficult. I was first immigrant and be a woman And it wasn't that easy. And everywhere that I would go to, I basically opened the Women's Wear Daily and I would look at all the positions and I would go for an interview and they would tell me, oh, but you have no experience. I said, how would I have experience? You don't give me an opportunity. (laughs) This is finished school. (laughs) Took me a while. And this is a very long story, so I'm going to make it shorter. The bottom line is that I did find a job after 
couple of months. In the meantime, I took some classes at Parsons. You know, I just didn't want to waste time. And uh, my first job, actually throughout my career till I started my own, I was at four places, which is considering how quickly people come and go for companies today, this is quite impressive. So I literally was like about six years in every company that I worked for. Mm -hmm. And the very first one was a very a brilliant woman that basically came up with the idea of sourcing in the Far East, which was new in the 80s. Uh, a lot of companies were still making things in the US and making things in Taiwan and Korea and Hong Kong was, not to mention China, that was not an option yet, was pretty, pretty forward. And she needed someone to go to each one of those countries that she established the sourcing and basically see what are the materials that they have and what are the capabilities and come up with a collection that later on would sit in her showroom and she would have her clients from, you know, she'd had a variety of clients that was buying through her. What are the capabilities and what can they do? So without absolutely no experience, basically graduated Shankar and that did not prepare me for that. And it was sweaters. So it's very technical. Yeah. And uh, I have no clue. I've never, besides, <laughs> so, you know, knitting here and there, crochet, scarves, you know, I don't really had no experience of creating sweaters. I jumped into it, and I think that's one of the things that you'll find that's it's kind of a thread that leads through my career, that I jump into things without really knowing where I'm going, and I trust myself that I'll do well. And I think that's really the key, that was the key to success in that particular case, and also going forward. Uh, I basically got on a plane, had no idea what I'm doing. As a matter of fact, she told me in the interview, do you know how to spec? And I'm like, I didn't know what she was asking me. Right. Uh, I said, sure. <laughs> uh, and then I ran to a friend and I said, what the hell is spec? He said, specifications. And I said, well, what does it mean? He said, you basically, when you design sweaters, you're supposed to give them specs. Like, what is the chest measurement? What is the length measurement? Versus a pattern. So, and based on your measurements, they're creating the pattern or the pattern for the sweater. I said, okay, I can handle that. Anyway, it was fascinating. I went to Korea. It was the first time I've ever been to the to Asia, to the Far East, and uh, Korea and Taiwan for me, like Hong Kong, was so exotic. People didn't necessarily speak English. I didn't speak their language. <laughs> uh, somehow we figured this out, and in a month of traveling, I came up with like 200 different sweaters from all these different places, from hand knits to machine knits to fine gauge to heavier gauges, which I didn't even know. I had no, no idea what's the difference what's the time. I just created. No magazines, no Instagram, no nothing. I don't know, I still don't know how to do it. As a matter of fact, when someone asked me a question of how I think I succeeded or to summarize kind of the 20th of, of success, it's very hard for me to put my finger at this point and say, okay, I know what it was. Right. Beside the fact, that I know that I'm very courageous, that I believe in myself, and I guess I'm talented. <laughs> but uh, there is no answer to it, you know, and maybe when I retire or where I sit down and write my book, things will show up and clear, uh, clearer. But uh, I almost believe that this is my journey. This is what I was meant to do. And somehow I've been guided through it and uh, found my way and obviously using my intelligence and my, my skills to succeed. But, you know, I do believe that there is some sort of a magic about it mm -hmm. that I haven't figured this out yet. One does one succeed versus the other. But without getting too much into spirituality. We can. <laughs> basically, this was my first job. I did it for a year. And then I met someone who introduced me to Adrian Vitadini that very few remembered, but she was the queen of all queens of sweaters. Uh, she was a, a very successful designer. We had something in common. We both were Hungarian in background. My mom is Hungarian, was Hungarian, and she was Hungarian. And that kind of connected us at least from culture and food. 
And she hired me, and I worked for her another six years. Adrian, I really mastered sweaters and cut and sew knits, and I became basically a sweater cut and sew designer. You know, working for her, I did swimwear as well, and um, it wasn't easy. It was it, it was not easy for me. I was living in the city at the time. I was already married for seven years. I desperately wanted a baby, a child. There was a lot of pressure from my Jewish families. Where is that grandchild or granddaughter? I know the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But I truly, the pressure came from myself. I really wanted to be a mom. And it was very difficult to even conceive the idea, working 24-7, traveling to Hong Kong and the Far East. You know, for Adrian, it was mostly Hong Kong. Uh, Lily, every month, every two months for a week, two weeks time. Yeah. And um, it was hard work. I mean, lots of time, you know, it's always in the heart in the physical sense of the word, but it was uh, difficult from two. A, it was long hours. And at the time people were not yet conscious about work quality and time and balance and all of that. And B, I was uh, newly married and uh, also not in my own environment. You know, I literally never lived outside of Israel. Uh, all my friends were left in Israel, my family. So I was pretty uh, on my own with a husband that I just married and, um, and a very demanding job. You know, I was figure out my ways and, and to, to be happy with what I have and just, you know, worked from morning till night. I finally got pregnant towards the sixth year that I was working for her, and uh, I left. Did you leave because you were pregnant or because you felt like it was time to go, or uh, both? I actually left after my daughter was already a year and a half. Okay. And I got pregnant with my second one. Okay. So one of the toughest things that I've had, and I tend to speak about it a lot because one of the things that in my agenda is to empower women, and no one there was empowering me. No. Not only that, was doing everything that I possibly can to make my life difficult in my motherhood. I feel like that era was very much like that. Yeah. It's, it's different today, but even the women that I worked with that came from the 80s, you know, it was, there wasn't support mm -hmm. of women or Not mothers. Most of the people that I went to school with, uh, the minute they got pregnant, married, they stopped working. There's yeah. very few remained, you know, in the profession. But in New York, you know, no one was pregnant around me. You know, it was just, when I was pregnant with my first one, with Ellie, it was just like, you know, looking at me, it's strangely that, w why am I here? Mm. And listen, it wasn't easy to work the kind of work that I did, you know, carrying a baby, and it was such a precious pregnancy because I was trying to get pregnant for quite a while. And then once I got pregnant, I wanted to nurse, and nursing also wasn't such a common thing at that time. And there was no tolerance, there was no empathy, there is no, okay, she's trying to juggle motherhood and her profession and she's really doing the best she can and I'm going to be a little bit more tolerant towards it. None of this existed unfortunately. And years later when I started my own, you know, that was something that kind of informed me how to respect mothers who are really, despite the fact that they're mothers, they're really fighting on their own yeah. uh, profession and to fulfill themselves. So I actually left when I got pregnant with my son. They're two years apart, so it was a little earlier than two years when I got pregnant. And I left and I basically, with no plan, basically to give birth to him and to see where I'm going next. But the options of not working at the time and f supporting the expenses that we had at the time was not an option. So somehow I managed, and what I did in between, I basically bought a house completely renovated it in Englewood, New Jersey, and sold it. So I kind of maintained the income without <laughs> working. Uh, it wasn't actually planned that way, but it turned to be that way. And it was actually my, this is where my career as an architect started. I'm now in the midst of building a house. So it's kind of uh, Full circle. parallel to, yeah, parallel to me doing what I'm doing. I'm always somehow involved with some sort of a 
architectural project. So Yoni was born, and I lived at Tenafly at the time, New Jersey, and uh, I met a friend, an Israeli friend, and he was working for Liz Claiborne at the time, and we kind of met socially, and he said, would you be interested in going back? To work. I mean, it wasn't that long that I probably left when I was six months pregnant, and here we are, like he's probably one month old, and I'm already considering going back. So I obviously was with Joni, with Yoni, I think about six weeks. Wow. Or, you know, that was kind of the common thing, or maybe Oof. two months. <laughs> And uh, then I had to figure out, now I have two. So I had to figure out how to handle it, and no family, obviously, around me. And he kind of caught my curiosity, and he said, Liz Claiborne is looking for a large size designer. And like, a large size designer? That I'm not. But you know what? I'm looking for a job from nine to five, so because I have the two kids at home. So you know what? As long as I'm keeping busy and I'm creative, maybe that's not a bad idea. And I interviewed at someone, you know, not even Liz, I interviewed with someone that was putting together, his name was Bob Cohen, in putting together the large sizes division for Liz Claiborne, who she was not apparently interested at all in having, but as she was a public company and growing, they constantly needed to fuel in with new lines, new businesses, and that was their newest idea. So I came in, I was there for maybe two weeks in that large size division of Liz Claiborne. And here comes Liz and Art to visit the new division. They saw my board and my presentations. The next thing I know, the following day, I get a phone call from the office of Liz Claiborne. It said, Liz Claiborne would like to invite you to a meeting, to a board meeting. The following Friday, what would you like for lunch? And I'm like, what? <laughs> the whole concept of thinking <laughs> about my lunch a week ahead was kind of funny to me. I showed up in that meeting. It was a board meeting. It was basically all the top management of Liz Claiborne, all the founders and you know the active management. And they basically opened for me an opportunity that they're looking to open another division that's called Liz and Company. And they feel that my talent would be much better used uh, in that division versus the large size. And I said, sure. And they said, we don't really have a concept yet, so maybe you can think about some ideas. Obviously, I came from Adrian, so the first thing that came to my mind is, let's do a sweater company, a cut and sew company, that it'll all be focused on knitwear. At the time, it was just like, what did they call it? Casual Friday. And all these funny frames, you know, about how does people kind of dress casually on Friday. So it kind of was tendency to go towards more casual, uh, you know, clothing. And so that kind of fit that space. And I went home and it was Friday night. And after the kids were asleep, I took a glass of red wine and I started to doodle and kind of think about a concept that I think I can present to them. And um, went on Monday, met with Liz an interesting story is that Liz, the building that they were in, it was all fashion. I went to see them there, and they actually, because they were spending so much time, like all of us, in our studios, they actually had a little apartment attached to their offices. So they actually, they had the kitchen, and Art was in the back, in the kind of residential part of that office. And Liz and I were going through the sketches that I did and the concept, and one of the things that I kind of came up with is that at the time also, I don't know if you remember, you might be too young, Macy's and all the department stores, I mean, they were selling Macy's and Bloomingdale's and all these departments, they used to go on sale every Wednesday. Every Wednesday they would go on on 25% off. So you kind of forced you to constantly design and design and fill up the stores with merchandise and everything would go on sale and it just became a kind of a circle that no one could get out of it. We're still in it. We're still in it. I'm not in the <laughs> department store story. So, and it, we are in it in making too much clothes, 100%. That will be my excuse one day to retire because seriously, it's insane. Yeah. But uh, that time, it wasn't just making the clothes, it's also putting them on sale every Wednesday. Yeah. So 
the clothes had no value and no life. So you just basically produce for the sake of sale all the time. Yeah. And people got used to those prices. So you would be, it was just a terrible cycle. And so I came with this idea and I said, you know, if we maintain the same color, the base color, which is the navy, the whatever the colors were at the time, the khaki, the, you know, the red, you know, if they're the same red and the same navies, you don't need to put it on sale. You can basically just put certain style on sale, but then bring in new merchandise to work with. I mean, for some reason, color labbing was a big thing at the time. You know, we were labbing colors because they were working at the time for 20 countries. So each group that they did, items were coming from different countries. So matching the red between the red that came from Hong Kong and the red that came from God knows where, (laughs) it was impossible. So you have people that was their full-time job just really sitting under the light and matching colors because the concept of Liz Claiborne was that she was coordinating everything. So the red of the shirt had to match the red of the shirt of the skirt or the pants 100%. So you spend all the time. And I said, wait, we're spending so much time on these colors. Let's just stay with the same red, with the same navy. Once you establish it, it's going to be the red for the next couple of years. That was a genius idea for some reason. Anyway, that was one thought that I had. So clearly I was thinking, you know, kind of more, you know, it was beyond design. It was like, how could you manage the business in a way that, the life of a garment is longer and you're obviously profitable for that reason. So I had all these business ideas in my head, although I had no background. You know, I studied art, fashion, the entrepreneurship in me, it's something that I was born with. And uh, anyway, I showed her the concept and the next thing she's yelling to art, art, art comes in and he goes, I want to start this business now. Wow. Obviously, it was very exciting for me, and they called in their sourcing managers and everyone that they needed, and we came up with a plan literally in no time. It's me and an assistant that I hired started this business that in one year was a $100 million business. Oh, my God. Those are the days. It was unreal. Obviously, they had the infrastructure. Obviously, they had the stores coming in and buying. Uh, not only buying, they had formulated in a way that they had to buy either package A, package B, or package C. There was not much room for them to. Uh, everybody came in, bought the collections. I mean, obviously, manufacturing. There was not a. There was a team that was manufacturing it. There was, a, you know, obviously, I was in the fitting and so on. But everything was set. Wow. So it was unreal, an unreal achievement for me. They were so generous, recognized it from the first collection, wow. treated me with flowers every collection, which I will never forget, which was much more touching than the salary that I received. You know, just the fact that someone really appreciated my talent and my contribution. And, uh, and of course, the salary went with it. And, you know, I was just at a great financial position out of a sudden, you know, I had two kids at home, I was able to get all the help that I needed. My husband was still in school. And meantime, I was like, you know, growing both on a professional and personally just growth that I didn't expect to be so quickly. And uh, I honestly didn't know I had all these talents in me. You know, I knew that I was you know, creative and that I could do things. But out of a sudden to not only design, but to know what to design and to uh, hire a team and to manage the team and to put together a strategy for the design and for the collections. It was things that I grew into and really didn't know that I had it in me. And it was very rewarding, challenging, but rewarding but it kind of prepared you for the it launch prepared, of, of your brand, which you 100%. launched in 2003. 100%. So almost two decades. Yes. More than two decades. Yeah. So actually, after Claiborne, just to make it short, I went, worked for Ralph Lauren. Mm-hmm. I worked for Nautica. And after Nautica, I launched my own. In each one of these places that I've been, as I said, anywhere around six years, I've learned a lot. 
When did you know after leaving Nautica, what made you say, okay, now's the time? So actually, you know, I was 23 years already in business yeah. for others. Yeah. And I've seen it all, done it all. I kind of felt that I needed a change. And I was always in the back of my mind was, you know, actually when I came to New York, I thought I'm gonna start my own business. And I went to my dad and he said to me, kind of translation from Yiddish, he said, you need to be cooked more. <laughs> and uh, I cooked for 23 years. And then one day, actually, David Chu, who's the founder of Nautica, reached out to me and said, hey, if you ever want to start your own business, I will financially back you up. Wow. And that's all he needed. And that's how we actually started together. And then after a couple of months, he uh, decided to leave to other things that he was doing at the time, and I continued on my own. When he left, did you feel like, okay, I got this because of your incredible experience, or were mm -hmm. you a little bit like, uh-oh? I was missing quite a lot of know-how, you know, in many areas, financing, you know, sales, you know. I felt I knew everything about what I needed to design and what the product, you know, what does women want at that moment. But to run a business on my own, I wasn't sure, but I went into it uh, because at that point I already presented the collection and I, uh, or, or maybe I was just making the samples at the time, I'm not even sure. But I did get some sort of a reaction that made me want to continue that. Yeah. And then I basically uh, went on my own, financed this entire business till today, stayed solo i'm the sole owner of this business and um yeah so and learned it you along know on my own along the way yeah so you stand out you know there are very few women-owned brands who have continued to own and maintain their own businesses mm -hmm. that have achieved the level of success that you mm -hmm. have so in those moments when you have to fund the production or mm -hmm. your store cancels an order, you know, these moments that can be crippling for businesses, you know, what did you do and how did you continue to stay strong? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's pretty unique for the fashion industry, but uh, the fashion industry has what they call factors. In my case, you know, the, I worked with Hilden. Okay as everyone else. <laughs> but that was introduced to me at a very early stage as I started the business. I had to put, the, uh, to put my house as a collateral. And um, I actually divorced at the same time. Wow. So I actually was at a point in my life that I realized that the word freedom had a huge impact on me uh, of how I want to live my life on all senses of the word. And it's not that I was in any form of not in freedom. I was happily married, uh, at least I thought I was. And then at one point I realized that I want to be on my own. I want to start my own business. This is what I want to do. I want to live in New York City. And I basically pursued one thing after the other. So it kind of happened together and one thing after the other. So. I launched the business in 2003, December end of 2003, and I divorced in 2007. So it wasn't right at the same time, but the process already started. Yeah. And so we leave my divorce aside and we continue with the business. So I went to Hilden and at the beginning, you know, uh, they financed the production and basically you're getting the orders as you know, you know, and then they finance the production and then you produce and then when you ship, you pay Hilden their commissions yeah. and you keep going. So the first three years, I literally did not collect any money. You know, I basically working 24 <laughs> seven, but again, I divorced. So I had enough money to live my life solo and invested the money. And then in 2008, I lost all of it. Oh uh, so I basically at one point after all these 23 years of working the way I worked, it was quite, quite devastating. But yet, I just kept going yeah. and uh, basically grew with the business. And only, I would say, in the last couple of years, I really was able to start enjoy financially my success. Uh, but I really put all, everything that I could in the business. I didn't know any other way. I didn't want to do it any other way. 
It's refreshing to hear because yeah. I interview a lot of people and I mentor a lot of up and coming and everyone wants the quick buck and the big exit and the big sale. And I'm always encouraging them to do the opposite. Right. Finance it yourself, grow it yourself, Agree. hold on to it as long as possible. Agree. Because then you don't have your freedom. Agree. And I think, you know, after 20 years, I can say, you know, I did it. You yeah. know, I am here. Yeah. You know, everything that I wanted to have, I remarried and still keeping my freedom on all levels. I do what I want to do, when I want to do it, as long as, of course, it's not on anybody's expense. And I enjoy it. I enjoy the sense of freedom that I gained and worked for. And what continues to fuel you? Well, I have a big family. I have a beautiful love. And that I would say that it's the main thing that fuel me. You know, and of course I love what I do. Yeah. I really love what I do. And when I said at the beginning that there's something about a journey that we are set to do, I think it comes also to if you're in the right lane and you're in the right place where you'd be, you will enjoy it, yeah. you know, because I think sometimes it's hard for people to find the right lane, but once they, the ball all falls into the right lane, it's just there to enjoy. That does not mean that it's not difficult, that it does not mean that it's not challenging. But in the core of it, you're doing something that you meant to do and that you love doing and you're good at. Yeah. Then the rewards is always to come. Yeah. Uh, and the rewards, again, are not necessarily financials. The rewards are just the satisfaction of to see something that you started and where it is, or to have people that, that work for you and you enjoy their presence and, and their work, or to have a beautiful spaces. For me, one of the things is I love to surround myself with beauty, and I do. I have beautiful homes, I have, you know, beautiful clothes, you know, that kind of what fuels me, yeah. beauty. So you have a unique perspective in that you worked for some huge, incredible brands, women, You've seen the industry change, right? Mm -hmm. From how you said you had the capsules and they, they <laughs> ordered. Even my chairman of my company will tell about the glory days where he made one jacket in Hong Kong and then right. made 20,000 units. And you know now you have every influencer launching their own brand today or someone thinks they're a designer. I'm curious your perspective on such a long, like I think it's been a long shift and I've only been around for 15 years, you know, but you've been around for you know four decades in this business. So I'm curious your perspective and then I'll let you go because I know you have four minutes. Yeah. I think that the ethics, I don't know if it's the ethics, but priorities has changed for good and bad. I think COVID actually accelerated it, but I think it started before. I think that people are less committed to their workplace as much as I was. And again, I could be my personality, but I, which I'm probably is. But I also feel that overall, like, you know, the way we worked way back then, it was on different levels than yeah. the way uh, people work today or I even expect them to work today. Yeah. I don't want them. As a matter of fact, everyone that comes to work for me, I tell them at six o'clock, you're out. Yeah. You know, you should have your life, you should have your life work balance because otherwise you're going to be no good yeah. and to be honest between six and nine o'clock you're not going to make any good decisions anyway <laughs> so you might as well go and enjoy your life with us we used to work every night till 12 o'clock yeah i don't know why that <laughs> was the norm yeah no holidays no vacations i basically worked straight 23 years and again it could be my my the achiever that i am but it was the norm yeah, it was the norm. And I think that's one thing that I can tell you for sure that had changed is the commitment, the time that people is willing to commit to their work mm -hmm. versus other things. And everyone is very aware of their vacation times that they need to go, their travel time that they need to go. Everyone is, is very aware of it and it's good for them. You know, I, I actually respect that. Yeah. Oh, I think good for them that they discovered it, that doing what I did is not necessarily the right way to live your life. Obviously, one of the biggest change from the process of design is Instagram mm -hmm. and uh, social media in general and how fast we get things. I mean, I used to, and I loved it, every week to go to a magazine store and sit down and rip 
the hell of those magazines and really kind of form my point of view of what is it that I like and what is it that I'm trying to convey or tell a story or, you know, through my designs and created all these boards that we used to do. I mastered it at Ralph Lauren where just boards of rooms of became rooms and clothes and traveling and vintage hunting and all of that. But years before Ralph, it was just basically creating beautiful boards, mood boards, and that award is gone. Yeah. Today, you know, everything before it shows on the show, you already got it in front of your face. I try not to go there. You know, my process is very different. I feel that by now, I have accumulated enough data in my brain and in my soul <laughs> that I can use it and I don't need to look out. I can just look in. Yeah. And um, I basically design collections that I feel that I want to wear and everyone who wants to join me is welcome. But that is my way of holding on to how different I am will be from anyone else or how unique I will be, or what makes me versus what makes another designer. If I stick to my own vision, my own point of view, uh, and I could be influenced, of course, by things that I see, but I am coming out of, you know, what is it that I want to wear? Uh, and apparently it's different than what other designers wants to wear, so that makes all of us different. And uh, so the process had changed dramatically. The work environment had changed dramatically. To your point, a lot of companies just from the get-go bring in a lot of money and put a lot of money into marketing. One of the things that I've done is I have not put money in marketing at all, right? at all, and yet managed to grow a profitable, growing business till today. Now it's the time for me. I'm actually thinking, okay, I've grown it to this point. I'm going to need to really invest in in order to grow further in marketing and really branding the yeah. brand because it's as big as it is, it still kind of remain small in terms of the awareness right. of how much people know about the brand. I think it's incredible. And I'll ask you one last question. Sure. What is a piece of advice you'd love to leave my listeners with, whether it was advice you learned from someone else or that you gained on your own? In life in general or just uh, related to... In life, to, in work or mm -hmm. anything? I think perseverance is something that a strong tool for me has been, you know, obviously staying six years at every job and then maintaining for 20 years, you know, my excitement about my business. And I think that really focus, and I know it's hard these days to focus, but, you know, as much as we can to focus on what is it really that we want. And I do believe that if you have in front of your eyes, what is it that you want, you will achieve it. I think when we get confused or get distracted by other people's energies around us, you know, it pulls us away from our goal. But really tuned in into, I'm very intuitive. I feel that I'm an intuitive manager too. A lot of the things that I don't know, I just listen to my intuition. And I think trusting yourself, going by your intuition, seeing the goal, seeing where you're going, and not moving your eyes from it, you'll get there. I love it. Thank you. You're very welcome. I just wanted to thank you guys for listening to today's episode. I also want to ask you to rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I know it's a pain in the butt, but it actually helps with search and algorithm. So if you love this podcast, it is an easy way to get it more visible and out there. I also want you to follow me on Instagram at Rebecca Minkoff at RM Superwomen and be sure to check out my book, Fearless, The New Rules for Unlocking Creativity, Courage, and Success. Thank you again and you will hear from me next week.